Hey everybody, what's going on? You're watching the Sit Down. I'm DJ Sixsmith. Your own Weissman's here with us. He's got his brand new book, Tank to the Top. What's up, man? How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. We're so last time we talked, uh, things were pretty different for the Sixers a year ago. They still had yeah. Jimmy Butler. They had JJ Redick, and there was actually basketball still being played. Also, <laughs> different. <laughs> so, I, uh, yeah, I was gonna say, I believe, I believe then I said I expect everyone to come back. So it yes. seems like a. Yeah, it's obvious I was uh, – I know nothing. It was very wrong, but no. <laughs> <laughs> well, at the time, it seemed like a pretty good prediction. Obviously, yes. things went a little yes. bit differently at free agency. And certainly an interesting time to be talking about the Sixers. So why don't we go backwards first? What was it like diving into this whole thing and putting this book together about the process? Um, it was both fun and not fun. It was challenging. Like the back – I mean, you know this. I'll give the background. Like the Sixers and Sam Hinkie neither really participated. Um – so Sam Hinkie, you know, he's an individual and I kind of thought, you know, I, I spoke to him a couple of times on the phone um, and he was very clear. He had no interest. Um, I thought, you know, it's happened before with stories and you think usually the guy breaks for lack of a better term. Like usually they kind of give in, like, you know, you reach their uncle and their cousin and their former kindergarten teacher and you know, all these things. And they keep hearing like, and okay. Um, Hinky, who maybe is one surprise people. He's a different kind of guy. Um, he did not. Um, the Sixers, on the other hand, so I always, I got to give my caveats is like, they let me show up for my day job. Like they never, for the most part, made a stink about taking away my credential for Bleach Report or anything. Um, so that power to them. Um, but when it came to like reporting on the book, they, you know, no one, no one was allowed to speak to me about it. Um, and they would remind former employees about NDAs to remind them not to speak with me. Um, so anyway, so that made it more difficult. It also creates sort of a challenge, which I enjoy. You know, it's one of those things like, looking back it's like okay challenge accepted and you kind of <laughs> go about it a different way and it probably made the book better because you know you you have a you have a time you have like a timeline you have a due date and like it's you have to go digging in other places if you just get everybody to speak to you for four hours um it's kind of easy to say you're done there um so yeah it was a pain it was a pain but also you know i, I really uh enjoyed it i like it the phrase i like having written really applies here like mm -hmm. i really enjoyed having written this book i can't say i like sitting down and writing it all but yeah yeah totally understand that i mean you reveal a lot of really fascinating things so what was the thought process also in like telling some pre-process stuff so it was like the alan iverson days and the billy king days like why was it important to start with that stuff initially i thought just i think like who was it as i said michael levine who's actually in the book from you know shout out to rights ricky sanchez guys but um he kind of called it a uh, the book of context mm -hmm. which i think is a funny way to put it um and i just feel like it's all like it's all connected like you can't just drop in it all matters, right? So to understand why the Sixers, why ownership, why some fans, why this whole group decided or had an appetite for this sort of rebuild, like I think you have to understand how we got there, basically how, I could say boring, but I just think the best word is bleh. Like just how bleh everything was from, you know, 2000, I don't know, eight, 2006 through 2011, whatever the actual years are through, through 2012, where, you know, I call it purgatory. They kind of not good enough to compete, not bad enough to get a good draft pick, boring, no superstars. Um, and it's, and then this, you know, when I was doing the research, I just found it fascinating that like Billy King, the former GM, like he can kind of consider their, the Iverson trade was sort of this real fork in the road moment where like they could have gone on a process like rebuild, we're going to tank. And they decided not to, um, and they got, they won too many games and they missed out on drafting Kevin Durant or on the opportunity to draft Kevin Durant. And that kind of sets them on this path. And there's, there's some symmetry there that is found really interesting. And there was a lesson there too, right? Like the lesson was obvious as to why, you know, you can have issues with how Sam Hinky went about things, which is why, I mean, the strategy is a good one. I don't really think there's an argument there. Like, you know, in the NBA, they reward that new strategy. If that's the correct one to take. So for somebody like you who spent, you know, hours and weeks and months studying Sam Hinkie. I mean, you even yeah. as far as to have a conversation with the guy he tells to have breakfast with, like, and never actually has breakfast with the guy. So yeah. <laughs> what is the most intriguing part about Sam Hinkie as the person uh, and Sam Hinkie as the person running the Sixers for several That's years? a great question. He is, so the way, the phrase I've been using is like, I think he's unique. You know, that word is usually misused and like he, in the literal definition, one of a kind, like he is unique. <laughs> like if I just tell you, people know Sam Hankey and you see like, you know, Silicon, you hear like the Silicon Valley talk and you know, he's living out there and those types. And yet he's from a small town in Oklahoma. Like mm -hmm. those two things by itself, right? Like he's a former high school jock 
I'm saying jock, that's not the right word, but this, how about sports star, right? From a small town in Oklahoma, like I don't know how many high school sports stars from small towns in Oklahoma end up living and preaching, living in Silicon Valley and preaching Silicon Valley type ethos, right? That can't be a big group. So um, yeah, that like, you know, he's both like the cliches, right? Like some of the cliches are correct in terms of he's a different kind of guy to talk to and some of the things, you know, I always refer to his article because again, he spoke to him and I didn't, but like Sports Illustrated's Chris Ballard and the profile on Hinky a couple years after the process, after he was out. And I think that was like, in terms of nailing Hinky, he nailed it. Like just the parts where like, yeah, Hinky does have those jock background, but like he's also, to Ballard, he says, you know, we should really watch games backwards or something like that. Like, why don't we watch <laughs> basketball games backwards? Because he thinks we're going to learn something new or something about like, if you know context, I don't, I don't even know, to be honest, I'm not even sure. But like, that's a strange thing to say, right? That, that, that kind of tells you a lot. So that part's true. Then the part that was interesting to me is one trauma. He has a trauma in his life, which is actually a, a, a theme in the book, a lot of these guys, right? So Hinky's his older brother committed suicide when he was 10. Hinky was about 17. Sorry, the opposite. Hinky was 10. The brother was 17. It's a horrible story. Um, and like, I, I mean, I would love to have asked, I would, you know, if we're sitting with him, I'd love to know how that informs you. I think like, I don't see any way that that can't influence how you go about your life. Um, but he found solace in basketball that like, he tells a story on a different podcast about like a friend's dad taking him out to a court and then kind of shooting to pass the night. And just, I think, you know, so again, it's all the Silicon Valley type stuff, um, the analytical type thinking and all that, but he also believes in sports. Like he loves sports. He wanted to be in sports. Like he like, you know, all the cliches, like he believes, maybe not a cliche about like clutch genes, right? But in terms of like the power of sports, he believes in that. Um, I, I think, I think it's fair to say. So it's like, he's just hard to put in a box. Maybe that's the way I would phrase it mm. best.